What do you think about body cams for police officers? The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Welcome in. Nice to have you in for this week's State of Mind. I, I'm hoping that you're all dried out. Uh, we didn't get it as bad as my family, friends, and the like in the tri-state area, New York, New Jersey. Holy cow. So by the time Friday night you're watching this, we record our program weekly now in the midday on Thursday. I, I will tell you, uh, the, the devastation and uh, the fatality count at press time, meaning as we're recording this, uh, is in the near two dozen area. Um, thoughts and prayers are a cliche, but holy mackerel. Uh, we have a headline or two or three on, on what we're dealing with here. Uh, just be aware that uh, while this was an incredible once in what, 200 year event, that, uh, you know, the, the Blackstone, the Patuxet, those places are at, uh, by the time you're seeing this, uh, receding from their crest, most likely. Uh, but this is a tentative situation, and uh, whatever preparations you need to make for the next one, because if we get another tropical storm and we're still in the season, uh, be aware. You know, the EMAs and the governments of the world uh, are not always uh, your real source of protection. Uh, we are. Anyway, uh, the Attorney General is with me tonight. You're going to meet him in a moment. Uh, we appreciate his accessibility. He's got some thoughts on body cam and, of course, uh, I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting conversation for the public especially since he's asking for the public for input, which is good, weird, but good. <laughs> uh, the president, speaking of a little bit of weird, uh, this week wrapped up this incredibly historic 20-year wartime investment in Afghanistan. Uh, headlines uh, about the pullout were all over the country, obviously, and you see the president speaking there. We have a, uh, a little bit of what he had to say. The extraordinary success of this mission was due to the incredible skill, bravery, and selfless courage of the United States military and our diplomats and intelligence professionals. For those remaining Americans, there is no deadline. We remain committed to get them out if they want to come out. I'm, I'm guessing that six months down the line, this whole thing will calm in terms of favorability ratings and poll data for the president. Obviously, he's taken a hit. How could he not with the scenes at the beginning of this operation, right? His speech, though, this week was defiant. I would say also defensive. And I'm not sure why. The, the, if he's uh, committed to the concept that he did right by us here, he should do so with a smile, seems to me. Uh, I will tell you, I think COVID is, is, is caused so much stress in everybody's life from the very, very top to the very, very everyday folks like us that it's hard to get away from what is a, a buildup of frustration that just kind of permeates everybody's disposition. And, and folks who help elected officials and top, uh, you know, top officials, even like our attorney general, whose disposition, you know, remains uh, pretty, pretty upbeat most of the time, you got to make sure that you shake it off a little bit. You know, you know, when we go into work every day, when we're dealing with our families, when we're dealing with our friends, when we're dealing with our neighbors, you know, shake it off a little bit. Remember that everything's going to be okay. Because I just think it's. I just think there's a lot of pressure on everybody, and, and the president was wearing it way more, way more than he should have in defense of his, uh, of his decisions. By the way, I can't ring a phone on the radio about Afghanistan. So that tells me that people more or less agree that we should have got out, and we'll be less worried about how we didn't, you know, how we got out down the line. Of course, we'll, we'll never, uh, you know, minimize the loss of life with those Marines. Um, Right. All righty. Uh, at home, real quick, before we get to the general, but I actually want to get his take just as a citizen on this. Vaccines, vaccines, vaccines. We now have a, a really percolating controversy in the state over uh, mandatory vaccines. Uh, we have, uh, you know, news stories and the like. We can pop that up if we can uh, on the vaccine situation here in the state. Uh, the nursing home workers 
are saying that, that there's, there's about 15% uh, population of nursing home workers that won't get it. Same with the hospitals. Uh, it seems to me, now we are recording this in midday Thursday. The governor's COVID briefing was scheduled for an hour from when we're doing this. You've already seen the news on it. But my, my intel and my instinct tell me that there's going to be a line of demarcation that this administration is going to or going to have to draw between what is congregate settings and individual care. And so hospitals, public and private, nursing homes, they're going to have a mandate. In fact, Governor Baker is making that move as well. Home care, firefighters, that kind of thing, EMTs, I think there's going to be some necessary flexibility uh, because they're different dynamics. So look for some evolving uh, thought process on that. I'm going to switch over and welcome the Attorney General in. Uh, we're here to talk about some body cams, and I'll always ask you about an investigation or two, and you'll give me the standard <laughs> answers. Well, I can't, I can't yeah. comment, but it's good to see you. But what, what is your, um, first of all, you don't have any specific role in, in, in the vaccine decision-making here in the state, correct? Look, only to this extent. Look, I don't make policy on things like this. The governor does, General Assembly does. There are times where those policy decisions are challenged, you know, truck tolling, um, evergreen contracts, this could be challenged and the office then has an obligation to defend those policy choices unless I see something about those policy choices that to me clearly cross the legal and constitutional line. So that's always how I look at these things. These are not my policy choices, yet I have a part of my job well, is to defend them up to a point. You, you know, well, guess what? You just uh, you turned it on with me there because I suggested two weeks ago that the State Board of Education overstepped its bounds mm -hmm when it decided to opine and then vote unanimously, ironically, to, to, uh, to squeeze the local school districts into a defunding penalty for not coming back with their return to school plans right. with a mask. Um, the governor got all caught up in that in, in the sense that he was, he was allowing the local districts to make those decisions and then he, then he, he moved on it. Um, of course, the General Assembly is sitting there going, he's got all the power, he should do it, but they also rescinded some powers, and while you might get it, the governor thinks he's got it, the lawyers who work for him think they all understand this whole thing, the general public is completely sure. baffled sure. by it. Uh, so I wonder as what, um, Gloucester, the school committee, yeah. is, is thinking about bringing litigation. Um, Will that end up in a category where it's litigation and you can't talk about it? Or no. It's more the, general Yeah, look, I mean, just generally, look, generally speaking, what our role is, I see it as this. Somebody makes a policy decision about that. The governor made one. The General Assembly made a, also a policy decision or a political decision. Then we're not going to come back and validate what the governor did with his most recent executive order. My job, if the, if the state were to be sued, would be to defend that executive order unless, unless, I think, as a matter of law, not a policy, because that's not a policy decision that I make. That policy decision presumably is grounded in the science. If I were to see, for example, that the science doesn't support it or there was some other uh, constitutional defect with that or any other policy choice, again, truck tolling, evergreen contracts, then I may not defend it. But, but that's sort of the process that we engage in. Show us the science. If you want us to defend this policy choice, uh, then we want to see the science, and then we'll make that we'll make that call whether to defend that or not. One of the things I keep telling people, though, no matter what the, the potential litigation, Gloucester School Committee, State Firefighter Union saying, you know, we we don't like this idea of mandate. Uh, in in any kind of health crisis, as extended as this has been, and you know, notwithstanding the debate that. It's not a crisis, it's a continuation of a former crisis, the Delta variant isn't make whatever. Judges are very, very hesitant to move against those who are either elected or assigned to protect the public health. Sure, there's a great, there's a great amount of deference here for, for obvious reasons. Again, that's why, yeah, you know, there's an element of politics here too, right? You know, politi you know, there's an element of opposing these policy choices. Um, there's a political element to that, we know that, but, but again, I try to ground what I'm doing in the law, and you're absolutely right, Dan, that a judge is going to give deference, and we saw this all across the country when the pandemic first emerged last year. They're going to, they are going to um, defer to our public health officials, so to me, that's where it starts. You've got to go back to your public health officials, if you're the governor, and then later me, if it gets challenged, say, look, what is the argument for imposing these limitations, whether it be a vaccine mandate or a mask mandate? Is it grounded in the science and, and, in, and in health policy? And if it is, 
then the odds of that being overturned by a judge are very small, very small. By right. the way, speaking of, now, now you're actually keeping my wheel spinning here. Do you, do you project having to weigh in at all ever on the decision by private entities to force employees to, to vaccinate? No, unlikely. Yeah, unlikely. Certainly if it's a state agency that did that, more likely. Um, so again, in our role as the Attorney General of defending the policy decisions of the General Assembly and the Governor, we have a lot of roles as AG. We have our own, our own powers and authorities that we're using. Frankly, we're expanding. But in this space, decisions made by the governor, grounded on presumably information that he gets from his Department of Health, it's our job to defend those policy choices. Again, unless I see something about those policy decisions, which is totally off the rails. And, and I haven't seen that in all my time as Attorney General yet, on, right. a, on a whole host of things. All right, we've had some controversies with the with, uh, police departments and some situations that have really, really made the body cam thing front and center. Uh, what you think about it next. It's these situations, and you know, in the old days, we thought it was unique when we got to see a cop show, right? And and we and and, and there was video, yeah. and usually that was somebody carrying a camera, as opposed to body cam. And over the course of the years, we've we've come to this. Um, you are through your auspice and through the public safety that's run by our terrific superintendent of the state police, uh, Colonel Manny asking for the public to tell you some things about yeah. what they think about body cam. Mm -hmm. um, give me the uh, executive summary on sure. what, you're, what you're asking for. Yeah, well, I think it's important to go back to where we started, right? We concluded as an office that we needed to make body camera body cameras available to every police department in the state because it builds trust in the system. And frankly, as prosecutors, it helps tell us what happened. And that's all you want to know as a prosecutor. I'm putting a case in, potentially, into a grand jury. I'm going to present it in court. The best evidence I have is if I can see it. If I can see it. So we always thought body cameras were important. So the question was, how do we fund them? And we, we solved for that. The office worked with others, Police Chiefs Association solved for that. Then the question becomes, now that you've, you've, you've obtained the funding, how do you roll these out in a way uh, that uses best practices around protecting privacy, public disclosure, when it's on, when it's off? Um, to me, before we write those policies, and we have some thoughts about them, but before we write them, um, it's really important, given the public interest and the press's interest uh, in, this, in this space, to hear, get input, so that when we roll out what we believe will be the best practices, at least we've had the opportunity to hear, hear from those who, uh, who want to provide input. So that makes sense to me. And so there's an initial period of written comment, there'll be a public hearing afterwards, and then we'll write these policies. And use of the body cameras, uh, or the funding to get the body cameras, is contingent on signing on to these best practices. So there'll be a universal set of practices and policies which will control every uh, department in the state. Well, I appreciate, you know, reaching out to the general public, and I, I appreciate the process. It's, I think it's, it's good faith, and it's, and it's good government, and it's necessary. <laughs> I'll tell you, though, uh, what do you expect? I mean, it's like, come on, man. You know what I mean? I, I'm not criticizing. I think this is the stuff you've got to do, but it feels very cursory to me. Yeah, look, you know, I don't, I, look, I think part of it is an opportunity for us, potentially in responding to public questions, you know, sort of forecasting where we might end up and why. I think, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding, particularly around the timing of disclosure that, um, that the public really doesn't have a full understanding of. And maybe there's a perspective I don't see, but here's my perspective around that. If I think there's a case coming, I've got to protect that case. That's what the pursuit of justice is. So if I think there's a case coming, I can't authorize the release of footage until every witness that has seen that event, I've locked them into a statement. Because otherwise, they could be telling me what they saw, quote unquote, based on what they saw on TV. Or someone can make that argument during the course of the trial. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding why we'll wait those few weeks to authorize the release. So that's just one area where I think more of a public discussion hopefully can drive a better understanding of some of the choices we make along the way. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, if it's more, in, it ends up being more instructive than, than investigative, because I, I, I just think that there's a lot of common sense practices that, that are part of this whole thing. Um, but to be honest with you, you may find this to be pleasing um, in terms of just my take. I thought the most recent release of the body cam footage in the most recent incident with those three young men who, you know, allegedly, obviously, but allegedly terrorized the city with BB guns and blah, 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 blah. Um, I was actually surprised at how quick he put it out. Yeah. Um, 
and I'm not always certain that that's great either, but I appreciated it. Mm -hmm. But I also, as I'm looking at them, I know you're going to not comment on my cases. You haven't, you haven't made a decision on that. Yeah, but one of the things I think the public also has to understand, and I hope you're instructive on this, is don't always believe everything you read and don't always believe everything you see sure. on just a body cam. Sure, look, uh, look, yeah, Dan, you're right. I mean, first of all, in terms of timing, we interviewed almost 30 people to get to that point. So there's a lot of work that got done to, to be at the point where we interviewed everybody who was there and would give us a statement. Over almost 30 people. So to do that in a matter of you know, a little over a month was good work by the investigators to do that, state police and, and Providence police. So, so we, were, we moved really quickly there, as we did in the Dolan case, the, the case down in, in West Greenwich, similar situation. Um, but you're absolutely right about the body cams for two reasons. Number one, they don't, you know, unlike the human eye, which sees, you know, the peripheral vision is like this, right? Body cameras are very focused, number one. Number two, and I found this in the case involving the moped in Providence, until you break down video, almost frame by frame, you don't get the entire picture, right? And so you're absolutely right that body cams are helpful. They're helpful, but they have to be analyzed the right way and they have to put in, be put in context with a broader factual inquiry. Yeah. Um, so there is a danger in putting them out early because conclusions can be reached before the entire picture is seen. And so balancing the cost benefit of that, frankly, is tough. Um, and something we're still working through here and around the country. Well, I, you know, I think you've always had a really, uh, I, I mean, a high level nuanced uh, perspective to, to explain between that which is the court process and that which is the political process that is derived from the court of public opinion, right? So that's, that's the, the rub here. Sometimes sure. there's a court of public opinion based on a release of videos that's already been established and adjudicated and then you have to decide whether even to take a case or then to try a case. Sure. So it's, yeah, look, look there's it, some damn if you do, damn if you don't type sure, of dynamic look, in the middle of this. And we don't know. Across the country, I've talked to my colleagues about this. We're talking to the Department of Justice about this. It'll be on the agenda for a meeting with the Attorney General of the United States within the next month. You know, we are balancing sort of the public's uh, demand, if you will, for this footage, demand for it, against preserving the rights of the accused and how we balance that. And five years ago, you wouldn't have found a prosecutor, I think, anywhere that would have said, you don't release your evidence until you're in that courtroom. Uh, but the dynamic has changed, and we have not yet seen, I think, the full legal ramifications of that. And I will tell you this, Dan, the greater the stakes in a case, so let me, let me just put this very bluntly, mm. if, if, heaven forbid, there's an interaction between the public and police where the person dies, well, my willingness to turn that information over early is going to be much more limited because the stakes are much higher in protecting that case down the road. And that's part of the balance we engage in as we're deciding whether to release it. Well, that, that, const that, that consternation that occurs in, in the middle of a, God bless him, George Floyd type incident and the like um, is something that you just have to weather. Uh, I think it's probably the more that you do actually provide access to body cam footage when it's not fatal, probably enables the public's understanding yeah. of your discretion when it when you have to hold it. So yeah, right. Look, so it, I, I, the more you do it, the more people get used to the process. It seems to me. Yeah. Right? Look and look. You have to be in a position. And that's why I appreciate you asking the questions. We've got to be in a position to explain what it is we're doing, and we have to be able to do that in a way that is at least hopefully to some persuasive. By the way, uh, you can provide input in writing uh, by September 24th to 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 talk about uh, what it is that you think about the body cams, just go to the HE's website and you can figure that out. A couple of questions on some uh, news of the week. Stay with us. Uh, welcome back in. The, uh, the story of the week last week involving the Attorney General was his uh, reported acquiescence to the governor to look into the chief of staff story. We have uh, a headline here, right? Uh, Tony Silva steps down as McKee's chief of staff. Uh, I've been around long enough uh, to know that anything that is under investigation is like pulling teeth uh, <laughs> to get an answer. The difference with this attorney general is that he shows up to say he can't tell me anything. <laughs> <laughs> which, I, which I always appreciate. Um, 
what can you say about that? Either in terms of what 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 you what you've done, what you're doing, or what your uh, or what your timeline is of any kind. Yeah, look, it's hard to put a handle on the timeline because a lot of it depends on you know access to people and and you know, frankly determining how cooperative people are. People are cooperative and sort of meet with us willingly and and all that and give us the records we're looking for. Then it goes a little bit more quickly uh, and all these all these things. Look, I think the governor did the right thing by asking us to take a look at this, frankly, probably would have done it anyway, um, you know, uh, based on what I was reading. I think, you know, and a lot of these things, it's just a matter of doing your due diligence. Um, you, who knows what you find in the end, but there are some things that just raise such questions and call into, call into frankly, uh, the reliability uh, uh, in government that, um, you know, having someone like the office and the state police take a look at something like this, I think is a good thing for the public. Yeah, I, I would, my, my guess is, my, my guess is, I might as well put it on the record, uh, my guess is is that you're not going to find anything significantly criminal, if at all. But you've already established precedent, you and I have tussled over it a little <laughs> bit, of opining yeah. uh, past an investigation. Sure. Uh, my guess is that you will, uh, you will lay out some of the uh, concerns, and then you'll probably talk about appearance issues and, and the like. And uh, from a political standpoint, not something the governor could deal with because of the distractions right. that were involved with the whole thing. Am I, uh, am I on the right track? Yeah, potentially. Look, you know, I remember when I was U.S. Attorney and, and it was right around the time that we announced the, uh, the indictment of Gordon Fox. Uh, former Mayor Cianci was running for office. Uh, and I opined pretty strongly in the context of that press conference that I thought that once you've taken the oath uh, to be a public servant and you betrayed that oath, you shouldn't run for office again. I mean, go, go after you've served your time, go forward and prosper. But I didn't feel comfortable with that. And so I'm not shy about sharing that viewpoint. You know, I don't, I don't do it at the drop of a hat, but where I think it's important for me to do that, I, then I'll do it. You know, whether that'll come up in this context remains to be seen what we find. But, but I don't think that as someone who is sort of charged with that public trust, uh, to, not, to not say, uh, be candid with the public about what you think, um, would, would not be serving them well. All right, well, we'll, uh, we'll keep our powder dry and we'll see uh, how that whole thing turns out. General, appreciate it. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll see what you learn, learn about the, the body cams. And it's not like the office isn't busy. We'll have it back soon. <laughs> yeah. um, it's never dull at thank 150 you. South Main. Appreciate it. Uh, Thanks, final Dave. word when we come back. You should start using um, keywords at the end of the broadcast. Uh, today's keyword is patience. We need to be patient about this virus vaccine thing. You need to give public officials some room to be able to figure this thing out. Nobody wants to mask. Nobody wants to force shots. Remember that. COVID is the villain here. Remember that. See you next week.